Welcome to House of David Ministries. I'm Pastor Eric Michael Teitelman. Join me as we learn about the rich heritage of our Christian faith. In each episode, we explore a unique topic that will deepen your knowledge of Christ and who we are as His people. In this episode, we're going to learn about who is God's firstborn. Now, I find it interesting that God not only assumed physical ownership and possession over the firstborn of Israel, including their livestock, but he exchanged their ownership for the Levites. So was this necessary? I mean, after all, God owns the whole of creation. And what's so special about God's firstborn? So let's find out. The term firstborn is used extensively throughout the Bible, and God makes it clear that he holds a unique interest and affection for those who are his firstborn, whether of man, plant, or even the animal kingdom. In Numbers chapter 3, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn of Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. So God gave the firstborn Israelite male special status concerning their inheritance rights. This included their herds and flocks that were used in the temple sacrifices. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, it says that a father was obligated to acknowledge his firstborn son as his principal heir and to grant him a double portion of his estate as an inheritance. In Genesis, on the other hand, we see that the primogeniture was disregarded in the lineage of Abraham. The primogeniture is essentially the right by law or custom of the firstborn legitimate son to inherit his parents' entire estate. In the story of Abraham, the firstborn was chosen based on the offspring's predestination to promulgate the lineage of the Messiah through their faith and belief in the one true God. As the Lord said in Genesis chapter 17, But my covenant I will establish with Isaac. Now, later in the story, Jacob contended with Esau over the birthright, which in Hebrew is called the Bechorah, when he secured it from Esau. Esau had despised his birthright and later contended for the blessing from Jacob, and the blessing in Hebrew is called the Beracha. In Judaism, the understanding of the firstborn, Bechor, is a mystery. The Hebrew word for first fruits, bikorim, derives from the same root as firstborn, bekor. Also, the term ba- birthright, bekorah, and blessing, beracha, derive from this root as well. So, there's a correlation between all that comes first in the creation, including the birthright and its associated blessings. So, while the firstborn of both man and animal belong to God, the first fruits, including the first grains, were brought as an offering to God in the temple from the time of Shavuot or Pentecost all the way to the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. They were also accompanied by other peace offerings, in Hebrew called Shalamim. And these gifts, both plant and animal, were given to the sons of Aaron, who were the priests. They were called the Kohanim, given to him as a gift. The Levites, who were taken by the Lord as a possession in exchange for the firstborn of Israel, were also given to Aaron as a gift to serve in the temple. Now those of us who are predestined to become God's possession are privileged to partake in all that belongs exclusively to him. In Romans chapter 8 it says, For whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The Lord made a promise that Israel would be to him, in a future tense, a kingdom of priests. Now, future signifies that God's promise was conditional upon the fulfillment of a mystery that was yet to be revealed. In Exodus chapter 19, the Lord said, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Paul affirmed this in Romans chapter 16 when he declared, The revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. Christ was that mystery to Israel and the world, and so is the church. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. 
Now, a token of this future promise was bestowed upon the sons of Levi, specifically the sons of Aaron, as an eternal priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood and the Levites who served in the temple were a type or a shadow of the priesthood of Christ and his church. However, this priesthood is established by an eternal order that was set apart from the creation and is without beginning or end. In Jewish tradition, the characterization of first fruits of vigor, Bekoreshit On, is like the relationship between a father and his firstborn heir in royal succession. Similarly, the specification of firstborn, Bekor, is also akin to the first assurance from the womb, signifying religious or priestly significance. The first tradition stresses the biological link to the father, while the second one stresses the link to the mother. And the correlation is intriguing and reveals the two characteristics of Yeshua's ministry, both his royal and his priestly successions. If we study the genealogy of Christ, we find in Matthew and Mark two different accounts of his lineage. Matthew emphasizes Christ's title and lineage through his adopted father, Joseph, as the anointed Messiah of Israel. He refers to Yeshua as both the son of Abraham and the son of David. The narrative reveals that Yeshua was an Israelite and the son or descendant of both Abraham and King David, affirming his royal succession as the king of Israel. In Psalm 89, it says, Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Notice how we as the sons of Adam are now adopted into God's kingdom, for it says in Romans chapter 8, You receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, Luke, on the other hand, emphasizes Christ's lineage through his natural mother, Mary. This narrative does not refer to Yeshua as the son of David, but rather as the son of Joseph. While it does follow the Davidic line through the prophet Nathan, it ultimately links Yeshua's lineage to Heli, who is the descendant of Levi and the father of the Aaronic priesthood. So this narrative, in contrast to the other narrative, reveals that Yeshua was a Levite, affirming his priestly succession as the rightful high priest of Israel. But Yeshua's priesthood is from an order that was not created, but has eternally existed with God. It's called the order of Malchizedek, which is the king of righteousness. Notice how we, the sons of Adam, have become a kingdom of priests. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter, he says, chapter 2, he says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Now, we can take this teaching to an even deeper understanding of God's character. In the Jewish tradition, the right arm of God is associated with the arm of kindness, or chesed, while the left arm of God is viewed as the arm of stern justice, or gevurah. The Bible tells us that Yeshua has been exalted to the right hand of God the Father. And this compares with the words of John, where he said in chapter 1, the law which is stern justice, was given through Moses. But grace and truth, which is God's kindness, came through Jesus Christ. So how does this relate to Yeshua's kingly and priestly lineages? Well, his father's lineage associates Christ with the royal succession. When Yeshua returns to the earth as the king of kings, he will execute his father's stern justice upon the nations. But until that time, Yeshua's priestly attributes are revealed during the dispensation of God's grace. This is the dispensation of Christ's priestly succession, which is his kindness bestowed upon the nations, forgiving and atoning for the sins of the world. Now, I mentioned the left arm and the right arm of God, but at the center of God's arms, in a spiritual sense, is the body, called mercy, or rachamim. It's also the place of God's heart again, in a spiritual sense. But I believe this place is the mercy seat of God's royal priesthood that is in Christ that serves both man and God. And you'll notice that in the temple, the mercy seat sat upon the Ark of the Covenant, and this this was the place where the blood of atonement was sprinkled on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Therefore, God's mercy is revealed through his kindness that was justified by his stern judgment that he propitiated. In other words, he paid for through the blood of Christ. 
it says in Isaiah 53, it says, The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. You see, we the church are the recipients of that mercy and are therefore called to demonstrate God's mercy to a fallen and sinful world. While Israel was revealed as God's firstborn amongst the nations, her promise to receive the spirit of adoption through Christ remained a mystery until her Messiah would come and fulfill the law of atonement regarding sin and death. In Micah chapter 6, it says, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Paul affirmed this promise to Israel when he said in Romans chapter 9, He says, My brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. You see, the sons of Jacob were to become rightful heirs to the kingdom of God through Christ. And for this reason, all who are in Christ, both Jew and Gentile, have received the same spirit of adoption by whom we all cry out, Abba, Father. This was another great mystery hidden from Israel, God's sovereign work of salvation amongst the nations. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, he says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The apostle Peter had such an encounter at the house of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion. We'll read it for you from Acts chapter 10. It says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. You see, Cornelius feared God and had shown favor to the Jews. But still, the Jews were not expecting this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God had demonstrated his sovereign work of salvation among the nations, and without any requirement for the Gentiles to become Jewish. They were now in Christ, part of God's firstborn family. We know that God's firstborn is Christ. It says in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now, on a personal level, we can also conclude that God's firstborn are also those who are in Christ, and this is the church. In Colossians chapter 1, it says, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. You see, the church has not replaced Israel, but rather the promise of the church, which is the promise of Christ and the Holy Spirit, which was for Israel, has now been extended to the Gentiles. In other words, Israel was to become the church, an assembly or an ecclesia, a great multitude of every tribe and tongue and people and nation that would worship the God of Abraham and join themselves to God's firstborn nation, Israel. And Israel is still God's firstborn nation, firstborn, however, amongst many nations, as was promised to Abraham, In Genesis chapter 17, it says, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham or Avraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Now, God still has a promise for Israel. In Zechariah chapter 12, we are told, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. The day is approaching when the Lord will again turn his face towards Jerusalem and the Jewish people. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, there is an ancient Jewish custom for firstborn Jewish men to fast on the day before Passover. This commemorates the miracle which spared the Israelite firstborn males from the tenth plague that struck down the Egyptians. Some rabbis contend that firstborn sons should not fast for the entire day, and for this reason, in the synagogue, after the morning prayers, the firstborn sons participate in a festive meal where they break their fast early and continue eating for the rest of the day. 
This festive meal is reminiscent of a parable we read about in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 9, it says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. You see, the rabbis, I believe, are prophetic in their understanding of the significance of God's firstborn. The firstborn male sons of Israel who belonged to God were exchanged for the sons of Levi. And God made a substitute for them, which is also a picture of Christ's substitute for us, where it says in Isaiah chapter 53, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for our sin. And so for this reason, the disciples did not fast in the presence of Yeshua, who was God's firstborn son. So again, what is so special about God's firstborn? And I think by now it should become rather obvious to you that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, is God's firstborn. He is God's special and only begotten Son. In Colossians chapter 1, we read, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And it says in Hebrews chapter 1, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And because we are the bride of Christ and we are in Christ, we are also special and treasured in God's eyes. So come, let us adore Christ, Yeshua, the firstborn over all creation. And let us also honor his bride, the church, the firstborn from all creation, as Jew and Gentile together in one new man. For it says in Hebrews chapter 12, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Amen. If you have enjoyed this teaching from House of David Ministries, make sure you subscribe to our channel and don't forget to visit our website where you can sign up for our monthly newsletter. We pray the Lord richly bless you and we look forward to having you join us again for our next episode.